Welcome to another Fireside Chat hosted by Credo Wealth. For those of you that don't know us, Credo is an independent wealth management business founded in 1998 with assets under advisory of over £4 billion and over 7,000 clients across the UK, South Africa and the rest of the world. I'm Ainsley Tope, head of multi-asset based here in London, and it really gives me great pleasure to introduce our guest today. Tatiana Puman is Deputy Chief Investment Officer at Tobam, she, where she co-heads research and portfolio management. Uh, Tatiana joined Tobam from Swiss Life Asset Managers, where she was Head of Equity and Asset Allocation. Um, Tatiana is also on the editorial board of the Journal of Systematic Investing, and was a research fellow at the University of Zurich, at the University of Hamburg, and at Kellogg Business School. Uh, she's also a lecturer in finance at the University of Mannheim and an associate professor at the Hamburg Financial Research Center. Um, and Tatiana holds a PhD in finance from the Swiss Financial Institute in Zurich, and she was named Financial News's top 25 rising stars of asset management in 2020. Tatiana, welcome. Yes, welcome also from my side. I'm glad to be here today. Mm, perfect. And uh, you're, you're speaking to us from Zurich at the moment? Yes, indeed. I'm speaking from Zurich, so uh, my home base working from home as many of us still do today. Mm, perfect. And is, uh, how have things been over there um, during the pandemic and, and, and everything else? Actually, we've been quite lucky in Switzerland, you know, um, we're allowed to go wherever we wanted to go. So on the weekends, you could escape to the mountains. Um, and this was very good for me. And um, yeah, and otherwise, I think, you know, the situation is much easier here because we don't have such a high density of population as, you know, and towns like London or Paris and so on. So I, I cannot complain. Hmm. Perfect. No, yes, I've, uh, uh, having, having been staring at my computer screen for a year or so, I'm, I'm sure the, the, the views in Zurich are probably much more, uh, much, much nicer. So, uh, and, and thank you for, for joining us today to talk about all things diversification, a, a topic that you know far better than most. Um, so, so there is this uh, paradox in, in our industry that Everyone talks about diversification, but most investors are unable to properly define it. Um, so, so from a qualitative perspective to start with, how do you define diversification and, and, and why is it important for investors? Yes, indeed. So um, I think, you know, what people have in mind when we talk about diversification is, is that it, it is this kind of magic, you know, when you look at different assets and you're kind of summing up the risk of those assets that um, you know, the sum of these risks of each individual risk of, of different assets you're looking at is larger than you know, when you measure the risk of actually putting those assets together into portfolio and then measuring the risk of this portfolio. And so, so this you know, divergence, this is actually what we call the diversification effect. And this is something you know, that, that we know about and that we learned about um, and uh, that we kind of from a qualitative perspective have understood. And then maybe later on in, in this chat, you know, we will talk about what, what it means actually from a quantitative perspective. Mm. Yeah, and, and you know, um, uh, the, what, one thing many of us notice when we watch financial media is how, how they're very focused on um, forecasting expected returns and the future prices of, of, of different assets. Um, so so how, how important is portfolio construction and, and diversification compared to forecasting expected returns uh, for, for investors? So um, I think, you know, when it comes to forecasting expected returns, the big challenge is, is that, you know, um, if we think about portfolio construction and in particular, you know, portfolio construction for, for the longer term, so for really, you know, wealth creation, um, then you have so many different components that actually play a role that are completely, um, you know, unknown and that are very, very difficult to forecast, actually. So, you know, it's like policy, it's monetary policy and so on. Uh, which play a role here and then any very nice and beautiful economic scenario that you're might, might painting is going to become completely useless in the moment you know where the president of a big country decides to do this or that or a central bank all of a sudden you know goes in another direction than you expected and so on and so forth and, uh, and generally speaking also if we go you know down to the let's say security level and if we're thinking about point forecasts you know to do on securities in particular you know today given you know all the different um, means of information that we have, I think it's, it's very hard to believe that, you know, people will be able on a sustainable basis to actually really make forecasts and, and to say, you know, this stock is going to fall from the other stock. And so if you believe, you know, that that is actually very hard to have this crystal ball, you know, that tells you about the future um, and, and that helps you to make on a sustainable basis these, you know, very big bets, um, then probably it's the best to try to rely on something which is, um, if you want a given fact that we all know about, and that is this 
diversification magic or this diversification effect, which is about spreading out widely uh, the different bets you take in your portfolio and trying to expose yourself very widely, you know, to different risk drivers. And then um, in finance, you know, we all know that eventually for taking a risk, you should get rewarded. And so the idea being then, you know, that you get rewarded on a very wide basis. And that is, I think, a very good basis actually also for building up wealth, for creating wealth over the longer run. Mm. So, so now getting slightly more, uh, more, more, more quantitative, and what, one of the benefits of, of diversification is that it can reduce the, the volatility of a portfolio. Um, uh, but th this sort of leads me on to, to a rule of thumb that a lot of investors tend, tend to use, um, which is that uh, a relatively small number of stocks, say uh, between 10 and 20 stocks, is sufficient to diversify an equity portfolio. They focus on the number of stocks. Um, and, and I think you can trace this back to a, a, a chart in a general finance paper by Evans and Archer in 1968 that shows how portfolio volatility decreases as you add more stocks. Um, but you get most of the volatility reduction after 10 stocks or so. So, so um, is there an optimum number of stocks that make a, an equity portfolio sufficiently diversified or, or is the number the, the, the wrong thing to look at? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I wouldn't focus too much on numbers because um, then you're getting too quickly also into, you know, thinking about weights and so on. And um, what portfolio construction and diversification really is about is to look at the uh, correlation structure of your portfolio. So to look at, you know, what are the different risk drivers that your portfolio is exposed to? And the idea being, you know, that you try to exploit as widely as possible this correlation spectrum um, that is available to you in the given asset universe. And now um, by adding, you know, one stock after the other, um, the decision of a portfolio that tries to maximize diversification is really about, you know, is this new stock going to add um, new risk dimensions? So is it going to widen, you know, the correlation spectrum that I can actually sort of um, access to, um, you know, in, in this universe? And uh, whenever, you know, uh, you're trying to add a security that is just reflecting uh, things that are already in the then, you know, this diversifying portfolio wouldn't add them. And so this is also why you see in that journal finance paper, actually, that, you know, very quickly the um, diversification effect is declining because obviously, you know, with the first um, securities that you add in your portfolio, you're going to add the most different, let's say, di dimensions. And then, you know, it's getting harder to actually still add something. And so basically very often, you know, when discussing with clients, I tell them, okay, look, you know, I can show you that, I will build you a much more diversified portfolio using 30 stocks or, you know, even 35 stocks uh, compared to an MSCI World portfolio that has 1,500 stocks. So it's really not about the number of stocks. It's also not necessarily, you know, about uh, weights or, or something like this, but it's really about the correlation structure that you can achieve um, with the different assets that you have in your portfolio. And, and hence, you know, it, it really is about wearing your correlation glasses if you want, you know, when you look at your portfolio and when you construct a portfolio um, along the lines of diversification. Hmm. So number of stocks alone is, is the wrong measure if you're not taking into account how, how, how interrelated they are. Um, yeah. So, so how, how do you precisely measure diversification of, of a portfolio? Yeah, so um, our founder, Yves Fati, he has proposed a measure that we call the diversification ratio. And uh, the diversification ratio is essentially, you know, from let's say an economic point of view, it's about comparing, you know, what I mentioned earlier, this sum, you know, of the risks of every asset in your portfolio compared to the overall portfolio risk. So it's really about kind of trying to capture, you know, how large is this diversification effect? And the idea being if this ratio is for one asset would be equal to one, and then for more than one asset, if they're not perfectly correlated, it would be greater than one, and the greater it is, the more diversified is actually this portfolio. And it helps us to very precisely measure actually the degree of diversification of any portfolio. And it helps us also to have a measure in place that we can actually use and maximize in our portfolio construction to make sure, you know, that we actually capture as many risk dimensions as possible in our portfolio construction and that we balance them out actually very well. Hmm. So, so uh, just paraphrasing uh, in terms of the diversification ratio, because when you add all the risks of uh, the assets within a portfolio together, um, but then you divide that by the portfolio volatility, the portfolio volatility is obviously going to be lower because there's some diversification benefits. So the ratio between these two gives you um, yeah, a, a measure of um, how well diversified your, your portfolio is based on okay. how related the, the underlying are. Perfect. Yeah. So, so, so this diversification ratio, can you talk a little bit about how, how that number relates to measures of risk, such as 
uh, volatility. Yeah, so obviously, you know, um, so, so the way you have to understand, you know, this diversification ratio, um, so there are different actually characteristics of this diversification ratio. So we have published, you know, on, on a large number of them um, in academic journals. And, um, and I think there are a few things, you know, that are actually very interesting. So one characteristic of this ratio is actually that, uh, you know, under certain assumptions, you can say it's equivalent to the number of independent effective sources of risk to which your portfolio is exposed. And that's actually pretty cool. It's a pretty cool um, property. Why? Because today, you know, portfolio construction, I think we all know that it's not only about, um, you know, being exposed to an asset class beta or something like this, but we know that there are more risk factors, you know, in in market environment or an investment universe that we should try to get access to and that we should try to be exposed to. Um, but the big problem is, is to really define them. So, you know, the whole factor investing industry is about that you know they try to define those factors they try to find the right way of you know saying what are these factors about how can we um, basically proxy for them how um, can we combine them together in the portfolio and so on and um, even though the theory behind is very appealing and, and I'm very sympathetic with this and, and I think it's a great contribution um, putting you know the theory of factor investing into practice is really um, is really creating a, a big issue of of definition and of, you know, kind of creating stable and really diversified portfolios over time. And, but when I look at then the diversification ratio, given that um, by definition and naturally, I'm going to maximize the number of independent effective sources of risk to which I expose my portfolio by maximizing this number, I don't have to worry about defining my factors. I don't have to worry about, you know, the proxies to use. I don't have to worry about the right allocation model to use. This is done endogenously given, you know, the mathematical definition of that ratio. And, and that's pretty cool. And that, that is also why um, you will actually, you know, only be able to achieve a fully diverse portfolio if you use um, a measure such as, you know, the diversification ratio that really properly defines diversification. Mm. So, and, you know, I'm, I'm sure we'll come on to, to some of the research you've done on, on, on multi-factor portfolios, but essentially with, with factor investing, um, you know, the, in theory, they're trying to define sources of risk and identify them and then say, oh, you know, how, how, how exposed are you with your portfolio to these different sources of risk they've identified? With the diversification ratio, you don't, you aren't necessarily specifying what sources of risk you're exposed to, but you can show how diversified you are um, relative to, to independent sources of risk. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just to give you an example, you know, um, for instance, uh, the value factor. If you, there's a recent paper by... Uh, Stefan Kessler and some of his courses, and they show for, uh, for the value factor or using the example of the value factor that, you know, like for more than 3000 different versions of how you can actually define the value factor, you can have outcomes that are positive or negative for this factor, you know, depending on what choices you make on, on your way to the factor. And I think that's something that people are not very much aware of, you know, that uh, so they think, okay, value and quality and growth and so on. And they think these are kind of given standard definitions, but this is not at all given. And so it's something that we have to make up because the theory leaves us completely alone on, you know, how this is to be constructed. And hence, you know, you can have uh, given very subjective choices that people make, you can have a wide um, spread, you know, in outcomes. And so, um, and so this is, you know, really the issue about trying to define factors yourself. Mm, perfect. And then moving on from risk, um, in terms of return, does the diversification ratio, um, it, 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 how does that relate to measures of return for, for a portfolio and do more diversified portfolios earn higher returns? Yeah, so the, the very idea is, is you know, that um, by being diversified, you're going to access as many different risk drivers as possible. And so, you know, in finance, I mean, we, we sort of have this thought, you know, that um, eventually you should get rewarded for a risk that you're taking. Otherwise, you know, you wouldn't be taking this risk. And, uh, and hence, you know, um, you will be actually collecting over time uh, you know, different premia and, and you will be able to, to build up wealth in your portfolio. Um, obviously, you know, there might be periods of time where, you know, you have potentially certain risk drivers that become, become extremely dominant. And given that you're diversified, you will sort of emphasize them less in your portfolio than someone who's putting all, you know, his bets just on this one factor. And, uh, and so for shorter periods of time, you know, making this very big bet can result in a higher return but eventually you need to be able to perfectly time this bet to be able to, on the longer run, really, you know, fully um, uh, take your profits or you actually risk to lose it all over again 
uh, once you know the bet turns um, into the opposite direction. And this is what happens very often actually. And and this goes back you know to what we said earlier about return expectations. So it's very hard to make those bets. It's very hard to have those you know expectations about what is going to be the stock that is going to outperform. You know how is um, this in the sector going to perform? How is this asset class going to perform, and so on? And if we were to notice, if we were to be able to to time this in a perfect way, then probably we would be better off than someone who is diversified. But since it's so hard to actually really make those bets and and time on a sustainable basis, especially over longer horizons, um, it actually makes a lot of sense to to just kind of stick to very broadly spreading out the bets and then collecting all almost everywhere, you know your premia and creating your wealth over time in this way. Mm. So if you have a crystal ball and you know which asset is going to be the best performing, then you just invest in that one asset and nothing else. But for everyone else who doesn't have a crystal ball, then, then diversification so makes sense. Yes. Yeah. And mm. uh, at least um, I don't have this crystal ball, so there might be people who have it, but uh, I would like to know them. <laughs> I would like to ask them about it, but it seems to be hard, you know? <laughs> yes. Um, so so uh, the, the, this sort of relates um, to because uh, we talked about risk premium and, and, and being able to, to, to capture it in a diversified way. Um, if, we, if we talk about the equity risk premium and, and, and what people call uh, the market. So um, this concept of, of the market portfolio is, is, is somewhat different for, for, for what um, uh, you know, traditional investors think of compared to, to, to Tobin's definition, um, which is more, more outside of the box thinking when, when it comes to talking about the market. But before thinking outside of the box, I think it's quite important that uh, everyone first understands what's inside the box um, and, and there's a lot of misconceptions as I mentioned um, when talking about the market. So for those of us who are a bit risky on, the, on their portfolio theory, uh, could you spend a few minutes recapping for us how this concept of the market portfolio uh, came into being within academia? Um, and and you know, we, we can then talk about how, how, how your views might differ. Yeah, so um, what people today um, understand or what you know they're thinking of when they think about the market portfolio um, is actually, you know, something which we call the market cap weighted portfolio. So basically, so in the equity space, let's say, I mean, we can use this as an example. Um, so it's about, you know, kind of adding different uh, securities up to this kind of market portfolio or basket of, of, um, of different stocks by using their market, cap market capitalization um, to determine the weights. And uh, and what what I think is it's actually a big misconception to to sort of use this as a market portfolio because if we go back to the theory, um, um, you know what the market is about is it's really like a representation of you know the different risk drivers um, that are actually relevant in any given investment universe. And uh, and if I look at this market cap weighted portfolio, what you can notice is is actually this market cap weighted portfolio is buying actually um, those securities that are getting expensive and it's selling those that are getting cheap. And it's over time, um, but by this means, it's actually taking over time very dynamic bets and very big bets. And this, to me, is actually very far from, you know, this ideal that that you have, you know, when you're thinking about the market portfolio um, of a portfolio that doesn't take bets, you know, that is actually not biased uh, and that represents well uh, the different risk drivers that are actually present in, you know, um, an investment universe or, you know, in the overall um, economy in, in which an investor uh, is, and so I think you know um, it's it's some sort of misconception you know that that has established itself uh, over the years in the industry, and um, that people you know think that this market cap weighted portfolio um, in which they invested is a neutral portfolio, is an unbiased portfolio, and uh, is actually something that you know represents really um, the market. Hmm. And I guess relating back to sort of Bill Sharp's original work on on the capital asset pricing model, the idea is that oh. The, the market and obviously there's a there's some assumptions you need to make but but his inclusion is that you know um if you can diversify away um all sources of uh, risk that aren't related to the market that's you know that that you're left with what is what is rewarded everything else is is unrewarded um exactly and and you know and i think also um you know if you want um if the, so given that every theory has to make certain assumptions or well, i think you know the fact that Every theory has to make certain assumptions perfectly fine to me, because you know, in a way, what is theory about? Well, theory about is giving us a framework that we can use to, to you know, as a basis and to evaluate the reality, you know, and uh, and to be able to to define such a framework, you need to make certain assumptions and you need to simplify certain things 
because um, otherwise, you know, it's it's just too hard to to actually make a first step, you know, towards understanding what's going on and towards sort of defining um, a certain a certain set of rules and a certain framework. And and so from that perspective, that's fine. But again, you know, then very often, um, and this is something you know that I discuss very often with my students actually. Once you try to put this theory then into into the real world, you need to be aware of those assumptions. You need to be aware of you know the limitations that that come along with it, and and then you need to be able you know to interpret your reality um, in the light of you know um, how reality is different from those assumptions and how reality is different from theory as a consequence. Hmm. So so maybe we can dig into to some of those assumptions and, and, and how you feel that some of those may not may not translate very well into the real world for, for, for practical investors. So um for you know if rational investors um, what, what should they do there with their money investing in the market portfolio, does that what why does that not um uh, when, when I say the market portfolio, I, I mean of course cap weighted equity indices. And what 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 why is uh, what why does that fall down when translating theory into practice? Well, for instance, you know, um, if if you take you know the different stocks in in an equity universe, so let's you know suppose we take the S and P five hundred, then um, all of these assets, in theory, you know, this should be like a homogeneous set of goods, you know, that are priced in a homogeneous way and so on. Um, but the reality is that you know these um, assets are actually very different, and they have very heterogeneous risks behind. And so, um, and so basically it's not the same thing, you know, to look at one or the other asset, um, just purely, you know, from, from a risk characteristic point of view. Um, and so, so that is already relevant, you know, that, that is important to, to, to realize. And hence, you know, you, you have to be able also to say, okay, um, if this is really true and if this is heterogeneous, then, then potentially, you know, it makes a lot of sense also to give actually the possibility to each of those assets to, um, to bring in, you know, this heterogeneity in your portfolio construction, and uh, and this is something that you might miss out completely um, when you go for a cap weighted portfolio construction because you might overly emphasize very particular types of risks that are then, you know, really biasing uh, the overall exposure of your portfolio in one or the other direction. Mm. And and then you guys have uh, obviously um, Tavan's done a lot of research into some of the concentrated bets that. And market cap weighted indices are doing so. So maybe if we start with with, with equities, and I, I, I'm quoting a research piece that uh, you, you guys published in November 2019. So this is mm -hmm. before COVID and uh, and the um, all things that have happened since. Um, but you, you say between 2014 and 2019, the, the top five stocks in the US, so that's Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Google, and Microsoft, contributed over 40% of the entire index return. So that's almost half the index performance coming from just five stocks out of an index of, of around 600. Um, in emerging market equities, the, the top five stocks, Samsung, um, Taiwan Semiconductor, Tencent, Alibaba, and Naspers, um, contributed 87% of the total index performance over that period. So that's 87% of the return from the top five stocks out of around 1,400 stocks in the, in the MSCI Emerging Markets Index. Um, so can you describe that that, that research for us uh, into the concentration within traditional market cap weighted indices um, and how how maybe that's that's evolved uh, since uh, to you know the the, the the sort of post pandemic uh, period if you, if you like? Yes, indeed. So um, you know I think what is very important about this or the, the point we're making here about it is that again you know you invest into this cap weighted portfolio and you kind of think that. Uh, you're invested into something that you know is diversified and that is going to expose you to a wide range of assets and so on. But essentially, all that or most of you know what has been driving the performances of those indices over the last few years have been just very few stocks. So first of all, sector effect. So this is something that we've noticed also already, you know, in earlier years, like just before the oil crisis. You know, that you had the energy sector being extremely highly weighted. You know, in the overall. Um, in the overall index and you had the TMT bubble, you know, where everybody was about TMT stocks and so on. You had the financial crisis where, you know, financials um, were the new future, everybody wanted to be in there and so on. And so, so, so you know, this is sort of um, one point about it that we try to make here is that, hey guys, you know, be careful about what is actually creating the returns or what is actually driving the returns of your investment when you're investing into this cap weighted portfolio. Because it might actually be just a particular type of risk factor, so a particular sector, or even in most recent years, even worse, if you want, 
um, very few stocks only, which means also that you're exposed to very high idiosyncratic risk. Because imagine, you know, it goes the other way around and, um, you know, there are for some whatever reasons, you know, regulation or uh, you, we've seen in China, you know, that um, actually the uh, government is very much willing also to be still, you know, quite, um, let's say, uh, quite forceful, you know, in, in how they impose certain things on even very big companies and so on. And um, and so if you if you think about this and you expose your portfolio to, to so much of, of that one single risk, then, you know, you, you need to really reconsider whether you can still call this diversified. And, um, you know, the evolution since, you know, the 2019 study was actually, it just went on, to, you know, it just became worse. So today we have more than 20% of the EM index being represented by the top five stocks. And uh, it's about 20% for the S&P 500. And even worse so, by kind of trying to put together, you know, let's say DM stocks and EM stocks, you're thinking that you're actually diversifying across regions, but you're actually not because the problem is that, you know, these top stocks in the DM index, so the developed market index and the top stocks in the emerging market index, they actually, they have a lot of business together, you know, like mm -hmm. some delivering, um, is delivering to Apple like screens and so on and so forth. And so, you know, if one of them has a big issue, then potentially others of them will have big issues as well. And so um, essentially, even though you think, you know, you're spreading out also across regions, your bet and so on, um, it, it might actually not be the case that this is going to help you. But again, you're just piling up more of the same type of risk. And so today, um, if we look at, you know, our measure of diversification, which is this diversification ratio, and we look at it all, all over the place, we see that the measure is at the lowest levels we have observed, um, you know, since, since decades, actually. Um, and, and this is true, you know, all across the board. So whether we look at the US, whether we look at EM, whether we look at, you know, developed markets overall and so on. So um, really this, this evolution that we've noticed already, you know, um, a few years ago, it has continued actually and, and it has become even stronger. And today we really, we are at the highest levels of market concentration um, that, that, we, that we have been able to observe. Mm. So, so if I if, if I paraphrase for, for for many investors who are investing, you know, broadly across countries, across sectors in these cap weighted indices, um, they may have put their eggs in many different baskets, but that doesn't help if all their baskets are put into the trunk of the same car. In, when you when you look at it from a correlation perspective. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Mm. And in terms of um, the, the so looking at it from a through through the lens of correlation and the diversification ratio. Um, are there, uh, is there any relationship between the, the concentration me as measured by the diversification ratio and, and, and future returns for whether it's um, cap-weighted indices or all diversified portfolios? Um, yes. So obviously, you know, um, if you want, uh, what is this cap-weighted portfolio doing? So um, the cap-weighted portfolio, it, as I said earlier, you know, is kind of buying what is getting expensive and is selling what is getting cheap. So while you know the cap weighted portfolio is buying what is getting expensive, it's sort of playing a momentum bet. So for as long as this momentum bet works out well, um, obviously um, you know it's going in favor of this concentrated portfolio. Um, but it means that markets have to concentrate more and more and more. That means that sort of our future scenario is, is that the S&P 500 becomes the S&P 5 if we believe you know that this market concentration is going to continue and that the cap weighted portfolio can continue to take advantage of this high concentration. However, if you don't believe this, and if you think, you know, that there's a scenario where, you know, given the high levels of concentration where we are today and, uh, and also, you know, going forward, you know, potentially um, other drivers, you know, that might come into play um, and that might play a role to sort of um, deflate this concentration. So when concentration stabilizes or, even decreases. Um, this is a scenario where clearly, clearly, you know, the portfolio that is diversified can play out is it the advantage, you know, that it captures very widely the risk premium. And by the way, this is something that we've seen already happening in 2020. So in 2020, you know, like in, in the crisis, uh, we've seen that, first of all, there were a couple of biases, you know, that were offloading heavily in certain regions. So for instance, in, uh, in Europe, you know, you had financials and industrials being sold off um, very, very badly. And actually financials being sort of the, the largest bias of, of that region. And, um, and so a portfolio that was diversified would have been much less hit, you know, by this uh, big move out of this bias of the market. 
And then um, when markets recovered, this recovery actually happened in a period of time. And this is very typical actually for times of high uncertainty that, um, you know, asset prices, they become very, very dispersed. You know, so you have a very high dispersion in asset returns. Um, they move around widely. You know, you have one stock being there, the, uh, like one stock being down 70 percent, the other stock being up, um, you know, 10 percent and so on and so forth. And now if you have uh, bets and if you're very concentrated bets, you can be caught very badly on the wrong foot. However, if you're widely diversified in such a moment of time, then you actually will be able to capture this wide dispersion and asset returns. And this is also why we participated actually very well, you know, in the rebound of the market. So, so, so this is, you know, something that you can expect actually um, of a portfolio that is diversified, that it's going to be dealing very well, you know, with situations of high uncertainty, of wide dispersion. Um, and generally speaking, you know, when you come to this turning point, where high concentration is going to high market concentration is going to change or is going to you know kind of uh, re, re deflate um, then this is going to be the moment in time when uh, you know diversification is going to pay out by a lot. Mm. And then and we, we've obviously spoken uh, quite a lot about equities but you've also found some some interesting results with, within fixed income can you tell us about the concentrated bets within bond indices? Yes, indeed. So um, if you want, it's it's actually very similar to equity um, indices to the extent that, you know, the way how you define um, the weights for different um, issuers, you know, in such such an index, it depends on how much debt they actually issue. So the bigger, you know, or the more debt they issue, the heavier will be their weight in an index. And it means that sort of, you know, the bad guys, they will get actually the highest weights. And, uh, and what you can notice is, is that over time, um, you know, those sectors and, and those issuers that actually had issued the most debt, they were also the guys that had actually in, in periods of market stress, um, over proportionately high default rates. And so basically what happens is you're getting hit um, twice because on the one hand side, you are overexposed to a certain issuer or to a certain sector and so on and so forth. But on the other hand, also you're getting um, a much much higher default rate on particular you know on particularly those issuers and so and so basically that that's clearly not a very efficient way you know of allocating your risk and, and, and allocating your your portfolio you know in in the credit space and so for instance over the last few years you know in the high yield space what we've seen was a huge issuance in the energy sector and so you would see also that you know the the correlation of the high yield market with the oil price would rise steeply actually and, and would reach really high levels already in 2015, you know, just right before the first um, sort of energy crisis hitting, you know, the, the high yield market. Um, and then again, um, earlier this, so earlier in 2020, um, you could also see that the correlation reached again, you know, levels that were very similar to 2015. So correlation of the oil price with um, the high yield sector, and we were warning about it. We were saying, "Hey guys, look, you know, you are so much exposed to just this one single risk factor when you invest in those indices." And then hit the March 2020 crisis, and uh, and it hit very very badly. You know, um, investors that were actually overexposed to to this one type of risk factor, and um, and again, you know, um, it is something that from an asset allocation point of view um, is is not very desirable because it's very far away from you know what we could think of is actually a market portfolio. Hmm. Yeah. So the in terms of what you're betting on as an investor, if you think of position sizing, um, and and, and so, some people uh, sort of believe that should be proportional to to your expected returns. What you're actually saying with with obviously equity indices, the larger the weight, the higher my expected return, and then within um, within bonds, the more debt is issued, the higher my expected return. Which is not necessarily uh, when you think of it like that, it doesn't necessarily make economic sense for for what investors were were, were trying to do. Yeah. Exactly. Hmm. Mm, perfect. Um, and interestingly, you know, so we talked about indices, um, but but uh, you guys have also looked at um, bond ETFs and how when, when you're actually practically looking to track a, a, a bond index, um, there, are, there are obviously some, some nuances that come in in terms of what you can actually buy and sell. And maybe you can talk a little bit about that, 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 that research. Yeah. So, um, you know, the, the research we did on bond ETFs was actually um, comes out of a discussion that we had for, for a couple of years now. And um, it goes back to the fact that um, actually the way how investors started to use ETFs is that they used ETFs as some sort of liquidity provider. Because what you could see, so if you want bond ETFs, they don't exist or they don't exist at a large scale since such a long time. So they were really, you know, kind of um, 
gaining traction after the financial crisis. And, and one important reason for this was really that, um, you know, after the financial crisis, regulation hit uh, market makers. So they became much more constrained. And so they could take much less risk on their book. And so if you want the, the number or the, the risk taking capacity of liquidity providers would go down. And uh, at the same time, given, you know, the low interest rates and, uh, you know, all the QE programs and so on, there was like a, a very high rate of issuance in the copper bond market. So you had record levels of, of uh, issuance in the primary market. And, uh, and so, you know, this was meeting this kind of very low liquidity provision. And so what people started to do is they started to buy ETFs because they made the analogy with, you know, the equity market where, you know, ETFs are supposed to be these liquid instruments that you can always buy and sell and so on. Um, and uh, and then I said, okay, you know, I'm going to use this as my liquidity bucket. And whenever I have to de-risk my portfolio, I will just do it by selling my ETF. And, uh, and now, you know, you have to understand that um, these ETFs, they're usually, um, they're tracking indices, which are, um, actually uh, which contain bonds that are supposed to be the liquid part of the market because you know the bond market is a very different animal from the equity market and so a very kind of large part of the market is is, is not extremely liquid and you know it's you're trading um over the counter so you're not trading also on the on the listed market and so on so it's it's uh you know it's, it's a bit different and now um these indices that etfs use and track they are just representing a very particular segment of that market um, and so as an ETF manager, you're kind of stuck with this. And now what happened was that um, a lot of people went into those ETFs and they're basically three really big providers in that space. And so all of this money, so billions and billions of dollars, they were invested in exactly the same way. So kind of hitting exactly the same type of market segment and type of bonds. And now in normal times, this is still fine, you know, because again, you know, it's, it's a very liquid segment of the market and so on. But what happens in crisis times when people actually then try to actually use these instruments to create liquidity and sell them off, all of them at the same time, in a moment where the market is really under stress, what happens is, is that this segment of the market that is supposed to be the most liquid one almost, uh, you know, becomes almost uh, instantaneously the less liquid one and or the least liquid one. And, and then you get huge discounts to NAV actually on your ETFs. Um, and you have to incur, you know, those kind of fire sale losses uh, when you try to get rid of your ETF in order to generate liquidity in your portfolio. And and this danger, sort of, so to speak, you know, is something that um, you know we've been talking about actually since quite some time. Um, but if you want, it's it's always difficult, you know, to sort of be the prophet and to talk about something and to warn about risks and so on. Uh, but March 2020 was then actually a perfect, perfect, um, yeah showcase for um, what happens uh, to those instruments, you know, once there is a real liquidity crisis in the credit market, once, you know, there is an exceptional stress on this asset class, because we've seen huge discounts to NAV on those ETFs. We've seen actually that, um, you know, they have underperformed by a lot. Uh, those bonds that are in the segment have underperformed by a lot the rest of the market, and uh, and they've been all else than, than real liquid instruments. Mm. So like for, for investors who are using sort of historic index data to, to gauge assumptions and sort of do back tests, when you come to actually implementing, you, you have to be aware that yeah, the, 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 the past may not necessarily look like the, the, the future. Yes, uh, this anyway <laughs> is always a good idea to keep this in mind, yes. Mm, perfect. So, so we've talked a, uh, a lot about uh, cap-weighted indices and traditional um, indices across asset classes. Um, but uh, 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 approach that um, uh, Tobans pioneered is, is what they call the most diversified portfolio, which utilizes this diversification ratio. So can you talk a little bit about what, what, what the MDP is um, and, and how, that, uh, how that looks relative to, to a market cap weighted index? Yeah, so the MDP is really about, you know, trying to come much closer to, you know, what, what Harry Markowitz once thought of, you know, as the market portfolio. So it's really about maximizing this diversification ratio. So this measure of diversification. And uh, essentially, since I, you know, mentioned earlier, uh, this diversification ratio, um, you know, that sort of indicates you um, the number of independent effective sources of risk that you expose your portfolio um, to. So it is about maximizing this number and finding actually um, assets for your portfolio construction that will actually add additional risk dimension. So this portfolio, what is it going to do? 
it's going to look for you know the assets that are the least correlated with each other and the least correlated with the final portfolio. And um, and so basically assets that, that are actually just adding more of the same type of risk are not really interested in your product portfolio. So essentially assets that will not be retained in the maximally diversified portfolio, they're going to be more correlated with the MVP than you know the assets that are inside the MVP. So, so this is sort of a way, you know, how you can think of um, how this portfolio uh, makes its choices and how it's going to allocate, you know, two different assets. And, and the very idea again behind this is, is that we say, okay, we don't know the future, um, you know, we will not be able to um, really predict um, in a sustainable way, which is going to be the best asset class, which is going to be the best asset within an asset class and so on. Um, and what we really try to do is we try to very widely capture all the different premium that are available um, in the investment universe. And like this, you know, um, we, we get actually rewarded for the risk that we are taking um, on a sustainable basis. And over the longer run, you know, this is going to help you to actually create wealth. But at the same time, also we reduce risk. Why? Because given, you know, that we have this diversification effect that is playing for us that I you know, mentioned earlier, um, we are also having a portfolio actually that tends to be um, much less risky, you know, than a portfolio that takes actually very big bets as it is the case for, for instance, the market cap rated portfolio. Mm. So, so for, for, for an investor who is just looking at um, sort of a dollar weight, the way they would try and maximize diversification and minimize sort of, uh, any bias is they would put an equal amount in, in every asset. Of course, with the, with the MDP, you're taking into account the correlation, which essentially means you're, you're, you're trying to minimize um, or, or sort of equalize the correlation to, to the assets to the extent that you can. Yeah, it's, I think, you know, the um, one over N that you're just referring to is something that, you know, like people do as some sort of naive means of diversification. And uh, and it's actually, it's it's not too bad. You know, it's, it's probably um, it's probably a good idea. It's, uh, you know, better than doing market cap weight, actually. But still, you know, if you do one over N, um, imagine, you know, you have a lot of stocks that have actually very similar type of risk exposure. And now you're doing one over N, so you're potentially still, you know, piling up a certain bias in your portfolio. So you're not actively controlling, um, you know, the risk exposures that you have and, and the drivers that will actually be relevant for the returns of your portfolio. And so even though it might be a little bit better, you know, than this dynamic risk taker, which is the market cap weighted portfolio, it still might lead to certain biases that um, are actually not desirable over a longer run. And so uh, what I would really recommend um, to not only implement like an naive way of diversification, because another way of naive diversification could be also to say, you know, yeah, I take a couple of stocks from this sector and a couple of stocks from this sector and a couple of stocks from this region and from that region. But then again, you know, we get into the same problem. So just imagine, you know, you take some, uh, I don't know, chemical companies, some energy companies, some car makers, some this and that, and then you think, okay, so I'm, I'm super diversified. But you might actually neglect the fact that car makers, um, chemical industry, and uh, also energy industry, they all are quite sensitive actually to um, the oil price. And so you might sort of over allocate, you know, to a particular type of risk factor, even though you thought, you know, you were diversified. Or, you know, the example also that I mentioned earlier about emerging markets and developed markets. So the top stocks in emerging markets today, they are highly correlated, you know, with the top stocks in developed markets. And so um, potentially, you know, by only trying to diversify naively across, you know, a cap-weighted developed market index and a cap-weighted emerging market index, you might still end up with something that is very much skewed into one direction. And so you really need to go back, you know, to looking at the correlation structure of your portfolio. So wearing your correlation glasses um, if you want to achieve true diversification. And it's not just enough to sort of try to Kind of chop the weights, you know, of different region sectors, uh, single securities, and so on. Um, because again, you, you might just miss out, you know, certain uh, risks that build up in your portfolio, nevertheless. Hmm. So, so, so we spoke earlier about the, the the so-called market portfolio, and you know, having an un, unbiased sort of exposure to the equity risk premium. And in in, in what sense is the MDP potentially a, a better candidate for that than 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 the cap weighted index? So the MDP, um, I mean, we've shown this uh, mathematically and empirically and so on. So the MDP is really the portfolio that is the least biased of all you know, portfolios that we know. And, um, and so from that perspective, um, we think it comes the closest to the market portfolio or to what you know, in theory should be the market portfolio. Um, and clearly, um, you know, uh, it, it, is, it is much closer you know, to be 
to being this efficient, unbiased portfolio than you know a cap weighted portfolio. Hmm. Because essentially, the with the as as we mentioned uh, with cap weighted indices, you do have bets in there, and anything that's yeah. got bets is can't, can't can't be unbiased in that sense. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So, so in terms of um, some of the practical considerations when implementing a, a maximum diversification approach or an, uh, uh, building an NDP portfolio, maybe you could talk about um, talk about those. Yes, so you have you know this theoretical um, MDP, which is you know just about maximizing um, you know this ratio and so on and so forth, and and this is giving you a certain. Portfolio. But now, in um, in reality, what is very important to us, is, for instance, is that we create portfolios that are going to be really liquid, that will have a low market impact, um, and that you know um, generally speaking, we can we can trade very smoothly. Um, and so and so basically, what we try to do is in our implementation of the. MDP, we are, try, we are trying to get as close as possible to this optimal MDP. So we're always measuring, you know, actually um, our tracking error to this theoretically optimal MDP. And then we're adding a few constraints that are actually helping us to um, make sure that we have portfolios that have a very high capacity, um, that will have very, very low trading costs, and, um, and that we know we will also be able to liquidate very quickly, you know, in market times, you know, where Market, the market is under stress and so on and so forth. So, so these are, if you want, practical considerations that we need to bear in mind because if you're just looking at the correlation structure of uh, an asset universe, um, basically you're not interested you know, in these things. So the MDP itself uh, doesn't care so much about those aspects, but especially you know, when we talk about emerging markets and such a bit more, let's say, exotic type of universes, it is still something you know, that you need to be aware of and, and that you need to incorporate into your portfolio construction. Mm. So, so one 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 argument against using strategies that rely on on the correlation matrix and, and knowing the correlation between between assets is is that as an input uh, correlations can be quite unstable and, mm -hmm. and, and vary through time. So, so uh, I know you guys spend a lot of time on this and looking at uh, what you call the correlation hierarchy. So, so how does the changing correlation between assets over time affect uh, you know a, a, an MDP? Yes, it's true. So this is actually um, you know something that a lot of people you know have in mind. Correlations are unstable and so on and so forth. And, um, and yes, it's a reality, but for us, it's actually not very important. So um, if you think about a full construction across um, or along the lines of correlations, what is really relevant is this hierarchy in correlations and what is this hierarchy in correlations about. Um, you can, you know, use the example of two bank stocks, um, let's say, you know, JP Morgan and uh, Bank of America. And, uh, and then you can, you can, compute the correlation you know, of those two bank stocks. And then you can compare this to actually the correlation of, let's say, Bank of America and General Motors. And so um, it is very likely that um, you know, these two bank stocks, the so Bank of America and JP Morgan, they will remain much more correlated to each other than you know, um, Bank of America with General Motors. And so this is you know, the hierarchy of correlation that for us is important that this remains stable over time while you know, the the actual level and so on, this, this can move, you know, but for as long as auto stocks um, remain less correlated with bank stocks than, you know, bank stocks between each other, everything is fine for us. Hmm. So, so in terms of the, the absolute level, you're, you're less concerned, but as long as the, the, the assets in terms of how they are grouped relative to each other, don't necessarily change, you can substitute between them. Um, yes, exactly. Yeah. Hmm. Perfect. And, and, and one, one um, empirical observation is that correlations between assets tend to spike during crisis periods. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, investors are panicking, tend not to discriminate between what assets they're, they're in a hurry to, to liquidate. So how does the, the transition of stocks between you know, different groups of um, correlated assets change during crisis periods? And, and how does this affect um, a maximum diversified portfolio? So um, what you can observe is, for instance, I think, you know, like um, March 2020 is actually a, a very good example of, of such a moment in time, you know, because um, sometimes, you know, you have crisis hitting a market that will actually affect, um, you know, a particular segment. And, and then this particular segment, the assets in this particular segment, they become more correlated to each other and other segments are less um, affected. Um, but in 2020, actually, um, you know, if you look all across the board, like in I mean, since our world is so connected and, and the entire world was really hit by, by this virus, um, you could see it happening all in all countries and all sectors in equities and credit and so on. So, so it's a very good showcase, actually. And, and so what happens is if you have such a 
kind of generalized um, shock that hits, you know, your portfolio, yes, everything becomes more correlated to each other. And actually the level of diversification that you can achieve becomes lower because there are fewer risk dimensions that you want that actually really matter. So you're going to see that, you know, in that moment in time, if you measure the diversification ratio of the cap weighted index or also of any of our portfolios, it, it, it actually went down. Um, but still, our portfolios always remained much, much more diversified than, you know, the cap weighted portfolio. And why? Because obviously still, you know, there are other risk drivers of risk that still matter. And again, you know, the general hierarchies um, or the general similarities and dissimilarities that you might have between assets, they remain the same. It's just that you have one very dominant risk factor that kind of makes things move together more closely. But still, you know, the relative dissimilarities between, again, you know, a bank stock and uh, an automotive company, um, they will remain the same. And, uh, and hence, you know, you can again discriminate, you know, between those different risk drivers because the hierarchy um, didn't change actually. Mm. That's interesting. So, so um, now moving on to, uh, so we talked a little bit about cap weighted and we talked about the MTP, moving on to uh, another popular sort of set of portfolios in, uh, amongst institutional and uh, more recently uh, you know, uh, retail investors is, is multi-factor portfolios, um, which, which we spoke about briefly earlier. Um, and, and you wrote a very interesting piece on this um, recently uh, on the correlation within, within multi-factor portfolios. So obviously, you know, as a quick recap, factor investing is, is defining different sets of uh, sources of risk, whether it's um, value, so cheap stocks outperforming expensive stocks or size, small stocks outperforming large stocks, and then allocating based on these defined uh, buckets. Um, uh, can you talk a little bit about that uh, when you actually went to look at the, um, the, the, the true diversification of, of, of different multi-factor portfolios? what that looked like and, and you know how, how that compared to, to 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 an mdp approach yeah so um you know multi-factor portfolios is really about saying okay we're going to expose you to a wide number of different factors um so uh, basically it's about helping you know the investor to find a diversified portfolio so this is sort of you know what what you tell your investor if you try to sell them this, this multi-factor portfolio and um and as i mentioned already earlier the big problem about this multi-factor portfolios is actually is to find the right definition of a factor and to find the definition that is stable over time. And then when you put them together into a portfolio, you know, um, to find something that actually is really sort of um, combining different factors that are uncorrelated from each other and so on. So it's, it's a very tough thing. And so what we try to do is we try to see, you know, how, how, you know, how good of a job are those portfolios actually doing? Um, and we measured over time the diversification ratios and uh, and sort of the you know independent effective sources of risk that those multi-factor portfolios have over time. And what we noticed was is that on average, you know, for um, a very kind of a large number of let's say representative multi-factor strategies um, that are available today to investors, um, we noticed that they are on average exposed to just two independent effective sources of risk. Which is surprising, given you know that they are all sort of saying, yeah, we expose it to value, to quality, to growth, to low ball, to this, to that. So um, this doesn't really correspond to you know what probably investors would expect these portfolios to deliver. And when we compared this to our portfolio, then you could see that the most diversified portfolio is actually always, always, or has been historically speaking, always um, at least twice or even three, four times more diversified um, than those multi-factor portfolios. And, uh, and so this is basically showing you that, you know, um, given that the diversification ratio is solving this problem that I mentioned earlier about definition of factors and so on, um, it helps you to achieve diversification. While um, if you need to do this yourself, as, you know, the factor portfolios um, do, um, you will run into troubles that you're probably not capturing, you know, the full set of different risk drivers available. Um, and uh, and you're ending up at something that is very biased. And the reason why we actually did this piece of research, and this is maybe also still worth mentioning, is this because in 2020, you know, um, you could see all of these headlines, you know, saying, well, you know, what a bad year for quants and this terrible, horrible year, and so on and so forth. And and we actually we didn't agree uh, with this at all because it was a very good year for us. And and essentially, factor strategies they got pretty much into trouble in 2020. And so we said, okay, it's maybe worthwhile to to you know, dig a bit deeper and to shed some light on the reasons why this was the case, and to kind of also restore a little bit the 
let's say, reputation of the, the quant uh, managers because, uh, you know, people very easily start hitting on them. Um, and uh, and essentially what you could see is, is that in 2020, um, you know, the multi-factor portfolios, they were hidden, they were hit by the fact that they had a sort of hidden value bias. Um, that is due to the fact that, you know, their portfolio construction is not really truly diversified. And, and so the bias that they had at this period in time was just the wrong bet to have. Again, return dispersion was very high. So, um, you know, the value factor had a hugely negative return while, you know, other factors they had um, very positive returns and so on. And so um, this was really uh, detrimental to returns of multi-factor portfolios. And this is also why, you know, investors have been disappointed with uh, performances of multi-factor portfolios. Um, and yeah, and so this is basically why we actually felt motivated to write this uh, paper because, you know, there are always positive and negative sides to each strategy. And I think what is important is, is that you're aware of them. And once you're aware of them, you know, as an investor, you can actively decide whether you want to be exposed to them or not. Um, and what you can expect of a strategy in, in what kind of environment. Mm, perfect. And, and you know, going, going back to a, a, an interesting piece you guys wrote um, a couple of years ago, um, and, and then sort of slightly, slightly, slightly unrelated, but, but it, was, um, it, it was really looking at how having a long time horizon and being diversified is, is, is actually more similar than people think when people think of investment philosophies, you know, have, uh, being short term or long term and, and then, you know, being diversified or concentrated. These are actually very, very similar concepts. Can you, can you talk a little bit about uh, that, 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 that research? Yes. So that note was actually really about, um, you know, the idea that you can be diversified across the space. You know, this is what we talked about now, more or less, you know, uh, most of the time. But you can actually also be uh, diversified across time. And the idea being that, you know, when you're holding on to a certain positioning over a very long period of time, you're actually sort of um, making a lot of independent bets over time. And, and basically, this is going to take out noise and volatility, you know, that you might have, you know, in your final results of your investment. And it's going to stabilize, um, you know, the, the uh, return that you can generate from a certain positioning that you take. And so overall, you know, it's going to help you to actually spread out over time, um, you know, in, in the sense of diversification, the bets you're taking and hence to, to sort of um, profit also from this diversification effect. Mm. Yeah, I didn't know I liked the, the, the analogies you used with the, with the casino. And if you're, um, if, if, if you're betting on one roulette table, that's the equivalent to, you know, choosing one day to be an investment. Whereas if you, if you want to capture the, you know, the, the the profits available, you need to spread your bets over many, many letters. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Perfect. Um, and and just in terms of, um, we, 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 we talked about traditional asset classes, um, but there, there are obviously, um, with, with, with those, you, you've got a lot of historic data to be able to measure correlation. Um, how, how do you measure diversification for assets where you've either got very short histories or, or, or um, such, such as companies that have IPO'd or, or they're a new asset class altogether, such as cryptocurrencies, for example? Well, you know, um, obviously we always need a certain minimum number of, of data history um, to be able to actually use certain assets. So for instance, in, in the case of IPOs, you know, we need at least like, let's say like six months of data. And then, you know, we can also find proxies for, um, you know, the, remain, the remaining time series that we might still need so that we can sort of, um, fill up, let's say, the, the time series. So, so that, that is all right. The cryptocurrencies, um, I mean, we, we do have already quite, you know, a lot of data, the cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, you know, even like uh, Ether and so on. Obviously, for, for very new ones, um, we have little data available. And, uh, and so, you know, um, what we try sometimes to do is we try to sometimes also shorten the periods of time over which we compute our correlation matrices. Uh, because especially also, you know, for, for some of these currencies, it makes a lot of sense, given, you know, that um, the history of time where they're really traded is actually not very long. So measuring, you know, um, correlations over a very much longer horizon doesn't really matter. But I think, you know, these results, um, let's say for the very new tokens, they have to be taken with a little bit of caution, you know. So um, if you want, if you talk again about like hierarchy of correlation and so on, um, those hierarchies, they, they potentially might still change between different tokens and so on. So this is something that, um, you know, we 
you potentially uh, you know don't have enough knowledge about yet. But one thing that I think is, is pretty clear is, especially when we talk about you know um, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. So um, you know the idea of Bitcoin, for instance, is is that it's a sort of alternative standard of value that you know investors might use in their portfolio. And and the behavior or the if you want the economic drivers behind the value of uh, Bitcoin, they're very different, you know, from the economic drivers that um, you know you would uh, that you would see that affect actually asset returns. Um, such as you know equities or bonds and so on and so forth, and so um, and so this sort of fact and and the contribution then of this asset you know in the overall let's say cross asset portfolio context is something that we know already a lot about and and that we can also be relatively sure about you know and so so that is sort of the good message you know I can give you about this um, that in particular you know when it comes to thinking about cryptocurrencies as a replacement. Um, as a new standard of value in your portfolio, um, then actually uh, we already have a very good um, data situation today, and we we can actually very um, yeah very reliably already tell you today you know what is actually the diversification benefit that you can get out of adding you know this kind of investment to your portfolio. Mm. And Interban was one of the first to launch an open-ended uh, Bitcoin vehicle, so it's um, yes. that you, you you guys have some conviction there. So Tatiana, I want to thank you again for your time. It's been a great conversation. I'm sure our, our listeners will have greatly benefited from, 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 from all the insights we've, we've covered here. Is there anything you'd like to add before we sign off today? Um, yeah, so I think the only thing I would like to add is, is maybe just to repeat you know, the message that I think at least for part of your portfolio, in particular when you're interested in long-term wealth creation, I think it makes a lot of sense to, to bet on diversification if you want and uh, to kind of you know, expose yourself widely and uh, and then if you have convictions, you know, on the left side or on the right side that you want to implement um, as a satellite of your portfolio and so on, um, you know, you can you can go for it, you can try it. But uh, I think clearly, you know, um, it makes a lot of sense, in particular in those times today, we have so much uncertainty. Um, markets are so highly concentrated. I think it makes a lot of sense to to think about, you know, diversification and and to make this bet in your portfolio. Mm, perfect. No, thank you again for your time and, and thanks to our audience for listening. Um, this has been a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.